Hello there and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we are going to be going over Unit 5, Topic 7 of AP Psychology, an introduction to thinking and problem solving. When talking about thinking, we are talking about cognition. According to the American Psychological Association, cognition is all forms of knowing and awareness, such as perceiving, conceiving, remembering, reasoning, judging, imagining, and problem solving. People have spent their lives trying to understand the human mind and how it works. Over time, we've continued to learn more and more about the mind and how we process information. Today we know we use concepts or categories. These are mental groups of similar objects. This allows us to simplify all the different information we receive every day. For example, the concept of a ball will include a basketball, soccer ball, tennis ball, and other similar items. As we become older and develop more, we learn more and start to develop mental images to illustrate different concepts. This is also known as prototypes. These are specific things that best represent a category. This allows us to match new items to a mental image and sort the information into the correct category and concept. If we come across information that does not clearly fit into one of our mental images, we're slower to figure out how to categorize it. For example, is a professional gamer an athlete or is eSports a sport? Let me know in the comments what you think about that. When we come into contact with new information that we are unfamiliar with, we will often use anchoring, which is when we make judgments about new information based on existing information we have. For example, if I was to ask you whether Abraham Lincoln died before age 10, I have given you an anchor of 10 years old, which clearly is not right, but I would bet this would cause your answers to skew towards the lower side of ages. On the other hand, if I asked you whether Abraham Lincoln died before the age of 150, this would skew your answers to the higher side of the ages. Notice both these anchors are incorrect, but we use them to try and get closer to the correct answer. Now, if you did already know about Abraham Lincoln and you had already learned about him and you knew when he died, then you wouldn't need those anchors. However, if you had no information about Abraham Lincoln, then you would use those anchors to help guide you in your thinking, since that's the only information you'd be able to go off of. Now, in trying to figure out different problems, we use informal reasoning, which is extremely fast thinking. This is when our brains use shortcuts and different tricks to speed up the thinking process. We can also use formal reasoning, though, which is a much slower way of thinking, but it allows us to be more confident in our thought process. When we use informal reasoning, we can use different processes of thought. The first being heuristics, which are mental shortcuts based on our past experiences. Heuristics allow us to quickly quickly make judgments and quickly solve problems. For example, if you've ever lost your phone at your house, instead of searching the whole house, you might use heuristics to just retrace your steps. You'll only search the areas in which you were last in. That way, hopefully, you can find your phone faster. Next is top-down processing, a concept we've talked about in Unit 3. This is when we use our prior knowledge to interpret the information. For example, when you're proofreading a paper you write, you might miss simple mistakes because you know what the paper is supposed to say, and you ought correct the mistakes in your mind without even realizing it. Your brain is quickly processing the information and isn't clearly thinking it through. There's also schemas, another concept from a past unit. Schemas are a cognitive framework that helps us organize and understand the world around us. Schemas are based on our past experiences and help guide our perceptual set. For example, if I asked you to describe what life was like in my school, you probably could give a good answer that's pretty close, since you know what a school should be like and you can apply your schema of a school to the question. We also use mental sets, which are similar to schemas. This is when we focus on solutions that have worked in the past. For example, in college, I had some friends who never had to worry about when they were going to study or where they were going to study because they always pulled an all-nighter the night before a test or a large project was due. They did pretty decent on their tests and projects, so they just continued to study in this manner. Now, could have they done better if they spaced out their studying and actually got a good night's sleep before the test? Absolutely, they could have. Sometimes these mental sets can actually lead us not to consider better solutions to a problem. The last process of thought that's often used for informal research reasoning is a mental model, which is just how we process the relationship between items in our mind. For example, when thinking about a computer, we can right away understand that we should not dump a pitcher of water on the computer. We have a mental model that provides us an understanding of a computer and tells us that water plus a computer equals a bad day. All right, let's change gears now and talk about the different processes of thought that we use with formal reasoning. First up is algorithm, which you can probably guess has to deal with different steps. We are going to go step one, two, three, and so forth until we're able to figure out the answer to our problem. For example, if we're looking for our phone, instead of just retracing our steps, we'll make sure to go to every single room and we'll clear one room at a time. Remember, formal reasoning is not faster, it's slower, but we're more confident in our thinking. It might take us longer to find our phone, but we will make sure that we find it in the end. Next is bottom-up processing, a concept from Unit 3. Remember, bottom-up processing is when you interpret information that is complex and unfamiliar. We have to try and observe and acquire as many bits 
bits of information as we can, and then try to come to a conclusion. We also use syllogism, which is when we use logic to try and solve a problem. For example, if all humans are mortal and Mr. Sin is a human, we can conclude that Mr. Sin is mortal. This skill can be difficult to master, and we might fall for different logical fallacies, which are flaws in our thinking. For example, if I said Star Wars is better than nothing, and nothing is better than Batman, therefore Star Wars is better than Batman. At first, this might appear to be a logical statement, but did you notice the error? This statement is a logical fallacy known as equivocation. In this argument, the word nothing is referring to both not anything at all and all things. The context of the word changes and creates a vague and misleading argument with a double meaning. Lastly, we have diagnosis, which is when we focus on eliminating the different wrong answers to leave just the correct answer. You probably do this on your multiple choice test when trying to find the right answer. Now, before we wrap up this video, I want to highlight two other ways of thinking and touch on creative thinking. When understand how we approach different situations, we can use convergent thinking and divergent thinking. Convergent thinking is when we take a problem and narrow down the possible solutions to the single best solution. This is often done by formal reasoning. Divergent thinking, on the other hand, is when we consider a variety of different possibilities. In fact, we expand on the number of solutions to a possible problem. This can lead to new solutions that we may not have already thought about. Speaking of creativity and new ideas, we can look at the work of Robert Sternberg and his colleagues at identifying five different components to creativity. The first being expertise. The more knowledge and experience we have with a particular topic, the better chance we have at applying that knowledge in a new way. The second is our ability to use imaginative thinking skills. This skill is simply able to look at a concept in a new and unique manner, instead of a traditional way of seeing it. The third is a venturesome personality. This is a willingness to seek out new experiences and be able to take on risks and possible failure. The fourth component is intrinsic motivation. This is motivation from within. We're motivated to better ourselves and not just motivated by external rewards. And lastly, a creative environment. You need to be part of an environment that fosters creativity and promotes innovation. These five components are what allow individuals to think outside the box and create new and innovative solutions to problems that we all face. And just like that, another topic review video down. Now you know the drill, answer the questions on the screen and check your answers in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're finding value in these videos. It's a great way to say thank you and lets me know to keep making more videos in the future. And if you need more help with AP Psychology, check out my ultimate review packet. It's a great resource that covers all the units of AP Psychology, and it'll definitely help you get an A in your class and a five on that national exam. As always, thank you so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.